So the first 10 minutes of a fire scene. Sort of in tonight's objectives, uh, what I want you to be able to get out of this really is sort of understand the proper procedure for the responding units. Um, where should they go? Uh, who should respond? Where should they be upon arrival at a scene? Um, what's optimal? What is realistic? Because again, you know, the books have written it one way. The technique says this is the best way to do things, but sometimes uh, there's road construction. Sometimes there's vehicles parked on a pathway, uh, road closures, water main breaks. So these things have to be taken into consideration uh, as we go through this lecture. Um, I want to have you articulate and demonstrate the responsibilities of our member. Uh, what are we going to do on that first 10 minutes upon arrival? Uh, not only the chiefs have a job, but it goes all the way down to our junior firefighters. Everyone who shows up on the scene, uh, there's enough work and more to go around for all of us. So I'm going to sort of review some of the jobs that we can, you know, get ahead and uh, get on with. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, Lieutenant Lysing has joined us tonight. He's going to talk about uh, hose deployment and repacking of our hose lines. Uh, he's also going to talk about the apparatus layouts for many of our mutual aid companies. What do we do when we show up on scene and it's a Harris Hill pumper or it's an East Amherst pumper? <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and then we're also going to talk about new pre-plans for the Country Club of Buffalo. And uh, Jack shot a video today of the new MTFD uh, saws that are going to be placed in service in the next couple of weeks. So that's something certainly uh, you'd want to keep your eyes out. Here's what we have for tonight. Um, tonight we're going to move through the drill pretty, uh, pretty smoothly, hopefully. Uh, we're going to do a couple of scenarios. We're going to talk about responding vehicle placement, uh, and then we'll discuss and review the initial fire structure responses. Uh, Jack's going to take over and talk about some practical applications. As I said, hose lay deployment, mutual aid, country club of Buffalo and saw operation. Uh, and then we'll con conclude very briefly uh, with a review of the firematic information that we've covered. Uh, we'll debrief a little bit. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to provide you with a link either in the chat bar next to the presentation or I can email it to you. And that's really just a drill evaluation on how you felt tonight's drill went as far as learning initiatives, ease of use, uh, instructors, etc. cetera. Um, before we get started, uh, I would like to make sure that I point out to you um, where the bathrooms and emergency exits are. Um, so if you look around you, there's probably a bathroom somewhere close. Not sure if it's to your right or your left, but uh, please make sure you use the bathroom if you have to. Uh, emergency exits are the front door of your house. Uh, and then we will have uh, drill food afterwards tonight. So make sure you check your refrigerator for that because I'm sure there's something in there for you to eat, even if it is just dill pickles. Let's talk about a scenario, okay? And scenario one, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a little bit of a map and I want you to think about where should we go? Where should things be set up, right? Where should some of the engines look to go? We can use that chat bar to the uh, right-hand side of your screen to investigate this a little further and offer some answers. Or you can unmute your microphone one at a time. If you, if you open that chat bar up, you can see who's here. Open it up one at a time. Uh, maybe if you have a point to make, we'd love to hear from you. In this scenario, we get a call at Country Parkway. And what you can see on the map here is the yellow indicates our hydrant locations. The red indicates the FDC uh, connection. And now... As we get this call uh, to Country Parkway Elementary School, what we hear is that there is uh, smoke emanating from the kitchen area. And so once we see that, if, if somebody wants to offer um, where, what things do we need to consider? What's one thing that we can consider about this scenario? And again, if you want to use that chat to the right, that's fine.
Good question, Peter. Are the students in the building, right? Uh, what time of day is it? Uh, what day of the week is it? Uh, let's say that this is during the school year. Uh, school is in session um, and uh, it is one o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, what might that change? It's a dead end street. Excellent, right? We have entry to one way uh, and this is going to limit apparatus placement. We're going to have all of our apparatus bottlenecking uh, on the street, on the corner of Country Parkway and Hollybrook. And so where what do we prioritize? There's parked cars. Uh, if school's in session, that parking lot has a lot of cars to it, okay? Uh, and so we're going to have to stay around the outside of that. You know, it looks... It looks nice from here because you may say, oh, there's a bunch of cars parked in that parking lot, so let's use the bus loop. But if you you have to understand that the bus loop is actually where the students are going to evacuate to. And so we can't have vehicles pulling into that bus loop if there are students filing out. Uh, Peter mentioned, is everyone accounted for? This becomes a massive search and rescue. If the teachers aren't organized and understand uh, making sure that their kids are with them and exiting the building, um, we have a large area to cover. So we're going to get some big, uh, massive mutual aid for this, hopefully. Only the front of the building is accessible to the apparatus. Absolutely. Unless we're going through Slim's backyard, which I'm not sure that's quite accessible, uh, we're probably only going to be able to come in off of Hollybrook. However, we may need to drop and drag a five-inch five, uh, five supply line through some of those yards to hit different hydrants. Uh, we could be uh, very limited. Um, Mike, Mike Martin mentioned that, hey, this could be more than we really see. This is an internal structure way inside the building. And so... Uh, what we see from the outside isn't truly what we would see upon getting into the inside. Good. Uh, these are all these are all great points that we need to really start thinking about. Hey, when we get to a scene, there's a lot of considerations uh, in place. So as we move through, I think the first thing to identify now is. What is our proper order for uh, responding vehicles, okay? Everyone obviously knows when we get a call uh, to a structure fire that initially we're going to see our first engines out. And that becomes engine one from station one and engine three from our alternative station or station two. Now, engine two is often thought of as the second engine out of station one. But we have to consider that if there are two engines on the road already, we can we may prioritize and respond with truck six. Okay, two engines on the road headed towards the scene, truck six may be the next one to respond to. Um, following that, Rescue 5 goes. Rescue 5 holds a lot of our rehab uh, as well as decontamination equipment. And then actually Rescue 7 can respond if they have a full crew and if Engine 3 is already on the road. So understanding when we get to the station, what truck do I get into next? That's important. It's also important for those members who arrive directly on scene um, that they understand what is going to be coming next. Which one should be coming first? Which direction is it coming from? Is it coming from Station 1? Is it coming from Air Road? And how is that going to play into where I can spot myself as a responder to help that apparatus get placed and deload, get the equipment off of it, pull hoses, pull a pack off of? There's a lot of things that a fire department has to take into consideration when it gets to a scene. Um, we're going to be talking a lot here about these ideal situations. 
But as I said earlier, remember, there is a practical side to this. As the incident changes, so will the goals and the actions that we have to take when we're on scene. So it is a very fluid situation, um, and we have to be adaptable and ready to change our plan as we move forward. Now, upon fire department arrival, there's a number of things that we can start to immediately take care of. Um, scene size up is probably the first thing that will ultimately start to happen and then followed closely by uh, putting on or, or identifying the incident command for that structure fire. Um, apparatus placement, obviously, as we get closer to uh, the scene, uh, as more apparatus start to respond, that's going to become very important. Uh, establishing water, can't put out a fire if we don't have water, um, and so on. Always remember that your number one, or our, I should say our number one priority is life safety, right? If a life is at risk in the structure fire already, that becomes our number one priority. Now, we're not going to risk a firefighter's put ourselves in the dangerous excessively dangerous situations, um, but we want to make sure that we are there uh, for life safety. After life safety, then we talk about incident stabilization and property conservation. Uh, those are sort of the three primary goals. Some things you should be thinking about. Um, there is that abbreviation, RCOVS, uh, rescue, exposure, confine, extinguish, overhaul, ventilation, and salvage. Um, now, again, those may not stay in that same order, right? Rescue someone who is stuck inside of the structure. Uh, exposure, protect the surrounding exposure so that the fire does not spread from its site of origin. Confine it to that structure and the place on the structure that it's uh, originated. Extinguish the fire. As soon as we extinguish the fire, we can start to overhaul. And then the two keys, the ventilation and the salvage, actually can sort of fit in almost anywhere in there uh, as soon as we need ventilation to take place. Um, earlier this week, I put a question out on Twitter to uh, firefighters and fire officers, uh, and I spoke with one of the captains uh, in the city of Buffalo uh, on Truck 7, and basically just said, what, what are the three most important considerations on arrival for you at the scene? And, and without a question, the uh, conclusion was a 360 size up of the scene. Where does the first line go and what size should it be? How big is the fire? How much water do we need? Um, so those are things that we really need to start thinking about uh, as soon as we get on scene. Now, your job may not be all of these. Your job, uh, you may not be interior qualified. And so we're not going to put you on top of a roof with a vent saw. But if you are exterior qualified, there are a number of tasks that you can help with that can ensure the success of the crew that is working internal to the fire structure. So during your response to the scene, you're riding in your personal vehicle, you are riding in uh, one of the apparatus from main transit. There's a number of questions that you can go ahead and ask yourself. And these are important. And uh, Peter brought one of these up when we talked about the Country Parkway situation. What time of day is it? What day of the week is it? Are people going to be at work? Are people going to be at home? Are people going to be sleeping or are they going to be awake? Um, this pandemic has obviously changed a lot of that. The regular work week as we know it no longer exists. So this is going to change Monday through Friday how many people are at home? Uh, when you're driving to the scene, how do you see smoke? How much smoke is it? What color is it? Is it a very dark black indicating a lot of the contents are starting to burn? Um, is it a light, wispy, white fire that just might mean that someone is burning trash in the backyard and really it isn't a uh, structure fire? Uh, something that's important is we can identify where uh, what is the wind direction? 
uh, we, we always want to be weary of this because we don't want all of those contaminants blowing onto the responding apparatus uh, if we can avoid it. What are current weather conditions? Are the weather conditions uh, going to change? Uh, do you see a hydrant? Luck may not have it that there's a hydrant in front of the scene, but what you want to do is you want to start spotting hydrants, uh, maybe where your apparatus could connect to, or maybe where the second apparatus in can connect to. If you are, um, if you are a responding in a personal vehicle, this may be a good opportunity for you to identify, hey, I see a hydrant and that's the next hydrant in. I bet you the next truck is going to want to hit that. And so let me get my car out of the way of that hydrant, pop out, hang out near the hydrant so I can help connect the engine. Um, Richard brought up a good point in the chat here. Um, when you are responding in your own personal vehicle, uh, think about the dead ends. Think about trucks in a parking lot. Um, you know, get your car out of the way, pull into a driveway, stop well out of the scene so that the other apparatus uh, can arrive. And then another thing to notice as you drive in is what is already there? Who is already on scene? As a driver or a passenger in the apparatus, you have to constantly scan to see where people are, where the fire is, um, what obstacles there are in the street. Uh, one thing we know is that we want to keep the front of the building clear, and that's just for other apparatus uh, to get into. As you're arriving on the scene, something to think about is radio communication. Appropriate radio communication includes uh, the abbreviation CAN, C-A-N. What are the conditions? What actions are being taken? And what are the needs? Now, this may be a chief on scene because they may be the first ones there, but sometimes they may not be the first ones on scene. Uh, you may be in the apparatus uh, riding in the officer's seat during a daytime response, and you're going to have to respond with, what is? what do I see? What are we going to do? And what else do we need here? Uh, this can include the arriving unit, the description of what type of structure, how many floors, what's the construction type, what's the potential occupancy, are people evacuated. Uh, you also want to talk about what are the initial actions? Are you pulling lines? Is a water supply needed? Can you connect yourself right there? Um, call for resources. Remember, uh, there are five C's to appropriate communication. Be concise. Think about what you're going to say before you key the microphone. Speak clearly. Uh, talk about one task at a time. Don't overwhelm dispatch. Don't overwhelm yourself trying to think of everything you want to say. Speak calmly and in a natural tone. Have confidence. Stay in control. Follow the protocols that we have set for radio standards and make sure that the senders and receivers are getting the same information. Are they hearing what you actually said on the radio? Ask for confirmation or give confirmation to information that has been given to you. Incident command. Some people refer to incident command and they think, well, you know what, I don't have to worry about incident command because that's that's the chiefs, right? Those are, that's 991 and 92. But again, there may be a scenario where you arrive on scene prior to a chief uh, being present. Um, ICS requires that the incident commander be a member in overall command of the emergency incident. And now that, that order tends to move from the chief to the assistance chiefs, uh, assistant chiefs to the captains, then to the highest ranking officer present, and then ultimately it could land on the first arriving apparatus operator. So if you are the driver to engine one and no officers are on scene, you are the incident commander until a transfer of command is established to someone else. Also remember that when we do arrive at an incident, 
it becomes main transit command. And the reason for this is it becomes a unified command so that we're not talking about main transit 92, 91, 9. We're not adding these numbers. The incident command will be the main transit command if it is within district. Same thing if we go out of district, it's going to be Bowmansville command or Harris Hill command. Um, the other roles uh, are going to be things like our safety officers who are appointed. They're in charge of overall incident safety, making sure that things are done in a safe manner. Uh, a staging officer uh, could be on the front lawn, uh, appointed at the incident and used for assembling the resources and the firefighters so that when the, the uh, command post calls for a crew to go inside and vent, they're going to have fresh firefighters there and they're going to buddy them up and say, okay, you guys are my vent team. Uh, you're going to meet uh, Main Transit 9-2 by the back door uh, and, and you're going to take over your job there. The sector or crew officer is typically your firematic officer. Uh, this person is responsible for monitoring the crew position, the assigned tasks, making sure that uh, people are in and out appropriately. Uh, a rehab officer uh, oversees the rehabilitation areas and the EMS of the fire and working personnel. Now, by default, uh, this person becomes, as, as indicated in our SOPs, uh, the driver of Rescue 5 or Twin City. Uh, Twin City should be dispatched, but if not there, the driver of Rescue 5 can become our rehab officer. And then an accountability officer. Uh, this person accepts where the firefighters are, accepts tags, tracks their approximate location and jobs, and then returns the firefighter tags upon uh, leaving the structure. The accountability officer is important because they're the one that's going to be in contact with the main transit command or whatever command post uh, in case we need to identify PAR, in case someone is missing. Uh, in case something happens on the scene. We want to make sure we know where all of our members are uh, at all times. Now, the incident command is the one who determines the overall strategy. Is this going to be an offensive uh, attack on the, on the structure fire? Are we going after it? Is it going to be defensive? Are we standing on the outside looking at this as being mostly a loss and we're just trying to preserve exposures? Or is it going to be a transition? Are we going to try offensive and then transition to a defensive or vice versa? So the incident command is in charge for making that decision. Um, most oftentimes that's not going to fall on the average firefighter, but this is something that we should all keep in mind depending on when we arrive uh, on the scene. We alluded to apparatus placement a little bit. Uh, and I like to tie that in with the source of our water because without water, we're not going to be able to do our job. So the first engine uh, drives just past the scene uh, on the incident side of the road, same side, and that's to decrease uh, distance away, gets more hose towards the scene. We want to drive just past the scene so that this first apparatus gets a three-sided view of the scene. We're looking at the uh, one, uh, we're looking at the one side, we're looking at the four side, and we're looking at the two side uh, of the building, or front, right, and left. The only thing we can't see by driving by is the back side. This gives us almost the full 360 without even having to walk behind yet. The other reason that we drive past the scene is we want to leave room for the aerial device. We need that aerial device to be right in front of the scene so that if we have to deploy our ladder, uh, we can. This is something that becomes fluid, though, because we have to keep in mind there may be trees or power wires immediately in front of the scene. And so our aerial device may need to pull just past the scene or just before the scene if there are wires hanging directly over where they may be operating from. So this is a good observation for that first engine response to see so that they can uh, notify the aerial where might be a better placement for them. The second engine, uh, our policy is that the second engine stands by at the hydrant prior to arrival on the fire scene. Uh, 
Uh, and this is so the second engine can lay in the large diameter hose. Ideally, the second engine would leave a firefighter with the hydrant. Now, this may be a firefighter out of the apparatus. Uh, it may be a firefighter who has arrived in a personal vehicle and is now standing by that hydrant waiting for the apparatus. Then they grab the hydrant bag. Uh, if no one is present, it's an opportunity to wrap the hydrant and slowly pull forward to lay in and then have that hydrant hooked up with the next arriving firefighter. Our aerial device also goes to the incident side of the road directly in front. And again, we want to avoid any overhead impediments, especially we don't want that ladder being within 20 feet of active energized power lines. Um, that power can jump right onto the ladder, uh, and we want to avoid that, <clears throat> obviously, at all costs. Our third engine, uh, the third engine to the scene, typically is prescribed to stand by for orders from incident command. They may be laying in, they may be laying out, uh, they may be providing supply to the aerial device, uh, and so that's going to be a very fluid situation uh, for that third engine. Now that really talks about where main transit is gonna put their apparatus. But there's an important point that we have to remember, we're not the only company that will be responding. We will have mutual aid and additional firematic resources, including a FAST team, uh, Amherst Police, and Twin City. And they all need to navigate that fire scene just as we do. Um, so keep that in mind that there's going to be a lot of vehicles here and apparatus placement is very important, especially when you talk about something like an aerial. When we put those outriggers out and place that aerial, it's pretty much there to stay. Uh, it's going to take a whole lot to have to move that aerial device once we've got it set up and moving. All right. Another important thing to keep in mind is accountability. Um, again, we're still at the point where we're getting to the scene. Accountability is extremely important because this is going to let us know who is working, who's working inside, where might they be working, what are their jobs. So this way we can count people as they come out. You can see here a picture of our accountability boards that are in the uh, cabs of our apparatus. Uh, it's a clipboard. Uh, typically, it should be secured to the side mirror on the scene side facing vehicle uh, for the accountability officer to grab onto. Tags are given to each individual uh, and then passed on to the officer seat of the arriving apparatus. Ideally, one tag should be attached to the clipboard and then one tag given to the accountability officer or left in an obvious position at the entrance of the hot zone or the entrance of the structure itself. Now you'll see people take their tags off, some will hand them off, some will throw them on the ground. Uh, what the important part is is that it becomes an obvious error for anybody arriving after you to either add their tag to the group or for the accountability officer to go over, get that tag, and start uh, using the clipboard to identify who is in. For your safety, all entrance to and exit from the hot zone or the structure has to utilize the buddy system. We do not go in or out alone. If you are in and you need to leave, the person who came in with you should leave with you just for the sake of if something happens as you're exiting the structure. You become obstructed, you become disoriented, you can become lost inside of that structure. So make sure that you are using uh, the buddy system as we enter any of these hot zone situations. Another thing to consider um, is lighting the scene. Uh, this is this is a little more important than I think people give credit to. Uh, one thing that I have learned uh, myself that I really like to employ, uh, I learned this uh, from Andrew Fisher, is lighting the scene even before you get to arrival. Uh, hitting that mode on the engine, throwing the scene lights on as you pull up, 
This way you're getting a view of the overall situation even before you arrive on there. Uh, as a driver, you don't have to mess around with those lights then, putting it in park, trying to get it in pump, and putting the scene lights on. They're on and they're ready to go. Uh, make sure you light up both sides of the apparatus. Your scene may be on one side, but you may have firefighters working off of the vehicle on the opposite side. And so to give them visibility of tools uh, becomes very important that they can also see. Something to consider is what time of day is it? If it's getting near dusk, uh, you may want to put those scene lights on preemptively before it gets dark. This way, as the sun sets, we still maintain light on the scene and you don't have to jump off of the pump panel then to engage the scene lights uh, instead. So a lot of this, as you notice, is really thinking ahead. Okay, what's what could happen uh, in this scenario and how can I help that along uh, right now? <clears throat> Excuse me. Finally, we get to deploying the hose, right? Putting the hose on the ground and getting it to the door. Um, our speed lays on our engines, uh, grabbing the nozzle uh, and those first loops and getting the nozzle with the first coupling right to the door. This is so that first 50 feet of hose is ready to enter the structure uh, as soon as entry is made. We can also talk about taking a uh, pre-connected two and a half inch uh, from the hose bed. You may want to consider what advantages would a master stream uh, device, the blitz fire, the deck gun, or taking the deck gun and making it a ground monitor. Um, if you're thinking about those things, they do take a lot of practice. Getting them off the truck, getting the hose ready, and then setting it up does take some practice. So when you're at the station, it's okay to go into the back of the engines and look at these things. Um, remember, getting that hose out of the speed lay also includes flaking the hose, removing the kinks and the bends that may happen as we pull it out, and then establishing a backup line if we are going into the structure. When one line goes in, another line should follow it as protection for those firefighters that are leading the scene. So many of you are familiar with the way that our trucks are laid out. Um, we have our speed lays here on the far left-hand side. We have a yellow line on the bottom, a red line on the top. We flip those first two loops down. A firefighter can put their arm through those first two loops, grab the nozzle, and pull. Second firefighter can grab the second two loops of the yellow and pull the rest of that hose and flake it out. Third firefighter in can open those red uh, loops, put their arm through, grab the nozzle, and pull. Uh, one piece of advice I learned uh, in my training is it is going to be better to pull that bottom speed lay first. This way it is out, and then you can get to the top one. If you pull the top speed lay first, you're going to have the hose coming, and then you've got to get underneath it to flake the yellow line out. And that just becomes a little bit more difficult, not that it can't be done, but it's something to think about. You can see the rear uh, of our apparatus. We have uh, two pre-connects in our two and a half inch here. We have a smooth bore, and we have a combination nozzle. And then we also have dead lay, which is here connected to our blitz fire. Okay. So if you start thinking, you can start adding up all of these lengths of hose uh, for our initial question when we started the drill. Now, getting the hose to the scene is really going to be step one. We got to get water to the hose, and that becomes pumping. Getting to the scene, our initial water source is from the tank. 750 gallons does not last a long time. Many of you have gone through a full tank uh, very quickly, and you've been at scenarios where you are looking around waiting for that water source to be established, okay? Uh, I'm not saying be judicious about your pumping uh, and, and limiting it. We need to get water on that fire, but this is why it's imperative 
to hook to a hydrant and get water to that pumper so that they can continue past that 750 gallons uh, that they are holding in there. Uh, when you get to the door and we're ready to flow water, okay, the pump operator has uh, got water, that line is now charged to the door. Uh, it's important, confirm the order. Hey, are we ready to go? Chief, uh, main transit command, uh, we're at the front door, uh, ready to make entry. Confirm that you're going in the right place that the chief wants you to be. Um, open the bale, bleed the air out, make sure the water is right at the nozzle, ready to go, because when you vent that door, uh, you're just gonna feed that fire. And then make sure, here's, here's a little simple tip, get all the firefighters on the same side of that hose line. Don't have people pulling from the right and the left sides because they could get trapped between walls and corners. They could also be pulling inefficiently to get you down to the same place. Check the entryway for heat with the back of your hand before making access. And always do a pre-entry size up. Where are the escape routes? What potential hazards? Um, do we have radios? Everybody's got their SCBA. Does everybody have a buddy and know who that is as we're moving in the entryway of the door? It does you no good if you're gung-ho and you run way ahead all alone trying to pull that inch and three-quarter and everybody behind you isn't ready and they're still masking up. Um, give yourself that time to let everybody else get on their masks so you can move together uh, as a unified team when you're making entry into that structure. Now search. Search becomes quite malleable in that it may happen now, it may happen uh, initially, it may not happen right away, uh, search really depends on a lot of different things. Uh, is, is there occupancy? Um, maybe you've arrived at a, a structure that has no residence. Uh, it is currently shut down and being remodeled, uh, and you can confirm this. Um, but we want to make sure that we do confirm with either the occupants of the house that everyone is out and accounted for, um, we can also talk to neighbors. Who lives there? Uh, do they see their neighbor around? Now, this isn't going to be the most accurate way of defining is someone in there, but all of the information that we can start to gather becomes important. This is another great job for those individuals who are responding in personal vehicles and may beat the apparatus to the scene. Try to find out, is there anyone in there? And uh, who could it be or is everyone accounted for so that you can update the chief or the first arriving crew as to the situation or the need for a search crew. We're going to establish and stage the primary search crew. These individuals are going through the scene very quickly, again, only for life safety issues. Consider the time of day or the day of the week in terms of where might people be? Where should I be searching? Midday, we might be searching the living room. We might be searching the kitchen. At night, we should target our bedrooms or the entrances and exits to the door because if people sense that there is a fire, hopefully they are trying to make it to their predetermined escape routes. And they could be within five to 10 feet of that front, back, or side door. Uh, and we may need to pull them out very close to their exit or entrance. Uh, when you are going on a primary search team, before you enter the scene, you should understand what's our established search pattern. Are we doing a right-handed search? Are we doing a left-handed search? Uh, we're always going to turn in the same direction. We're following the rooms around. And then consider a search line if it is a large structure, as in a country parkway. Uh, we may have multiple search lines going in from multiple entrances. These are all things that need to be thought of even prior to entry on the scene within that first initial uh, 10 minutes or so. So some of you may be sitting there and going, you know, hey, Carl, this is all fine and good, but I do not have red tags and I am not going into the hot zone. I am not going into or on top of a structure fire. And I'll tell you what, 
your job is just as important as anybody who has a red tag. There are a ton of exterior tasks that need to be done in order to help the entire situation achieve success. These ex exterior tasks, something simple like flaking the hose out and helping move the charged lines towards the structure. Once an interior crew has made entry, they can't see what's happening on the front lawn with their hose line. Is it caught around a bush? Is it caught on a porch step? Uh, exterior crews become important because we're going to have to move that water and get it closer to the structure so that they can advance that hose line. So anytime you see a hose line moving or bumping or bouncing, give it a little help, push another loop towards the door, make that interior crew's job a little bit easier in all of the heat and smoke that they're facing. Another opportunity that you have is getting the saws off of the trucks and getting them started. Um, sometimes our saws may take multiple pulls to get them started. It may take two, three times. Hopefully they don't. But what you can do is you can get them in a start and warmed up mode so that they are ready in the staging area with the staging officer in case they need to be called for. You can start getting ladders ready. Um, this becomes another important issue with apparatus placement. If engine one pulls just past the scene and truck six pulls up right on engine one's bumpers, engine one's ladders are basically useless. We can't pull them out of the back of the engine. So you want to make sure that in truck placement, you leave enough room to get the ladders off of the apparatus because what we want to do is we want to start establishing potential, uh, the potential need for laddering a building making escape routes, especially from upper floors for interior firefighters and rescue operations that may need to take place. Um, we're not talking at this point about the venting ladders, but we're, we're talking about safety ladders put in place on all the sides of the building so that firefighters have escape routes uh, should they need to. That doesn't stop what the exterior tasks are. Um, Secondary exterior tasks, we know that the scene is going to be lit by the uh, engine operators and the truck operators. They're going to start the generators, throw the lights on on the scene. Rescue 5 is going to put their light up. But we also have all of our portable lights that we can help around the scene. Now, these are not intrinsically safe. Um, so we don't want to take them immediately into a hot zone, but we do want to be able to prepare them or understand where they are. We have uh, a number of quartz lights. You can see here on each of our engines, uh, right above our rolls. These are all located on the passenger side. Um, open those up. Make sure that uh, if you need a pigtail that you grab it. We may be talking about our Honda engines. Get these lights again, just like our saws. Get those started early. Get the lights ready to go just in case we need them. And then on Rescue 5, you can see here we have two of our stream lights. These are battery operated. Um, it's a good opportunity to start at least understanding where the lights are. And if they're called for, let's get them out, especially as we near dusk or answer a call that becomes after dark. Now, other things that our exterior crew can do. Uh, something that becomes very important as the initial attack begins on the scene is the setup of a rehabilitation area. This is important for anybody working the scene. Exterior, for command, for Twin City, for mutual aid companies, and then obviously for our interior crews. That as they exit the building, they understand where the rehabilitation area is. They can go to it after they've gotten their tags from the accountability officers. Um, all of our engines have cases of water and bags with hero wipes in them. So what you can do as an exterior or someone who is not actively fighting the uh, fire scene is start handing out water bottles, start handing out these hero wipes to our firefighting crews. Other apparatus that becomes available 
uh, for our rehab area includes um, our cooling fans. You see here four cooling fans that have been uh, stored in the coffin compartment above uh, Rescue 5. These cooling fans are used with these blue buckets here. Do not use them with the orange buckets. Blue buckets, blue fans, okay? Uh, if it's a hot day, feel free to get those, fill them with water, and start providing that mist around the rehab area. The other consideration for rehab are these cases of red hoods that we have on Rescue 5 and all of the engines. As we change bottles and enter rehab, an interior firefighter has to change their used hood with one of these red hoods when they enter back into the scene should they continue to work. So having these available, and you can see in here, they're right next to some more hero wipes so that we can wipe down any of those excessive carcinogens that may be present. Underneath these buckets and totes are tables and tents. This is going to be a long scene or we're going to be actively working for a long time. It's a good thing to consider, hey, maybe I want to get a couple of chairs down so that people can sit in them. Maybe we need some tents uh, to provide some shade or shelter from rain or shelter from the elements. Um, it's a good opportunity. They, again, are in the coffin compartment on the passenger side of Rescue 5. Uh, Brad has indicated uh, that our EMS officers have done a great job setting up this rehab and this decon area. And so what I encourage you to do is, if you are an exterior looking for something to do, find our EMS officers and ask them if you can help with this scenario. Uh, Nick Jackson had a question. If there are trapped occupants, Will the crew on that first engine become a search crew and the hose waits for a new crew? <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, that's really going to be a, a movable situation. Hopefully we have multiple people there at the same time uh, and, and crews are not that far off. But typically what we're going to be doing is we're going to be getting that line to the door with tools and then we could ultimately switch into a search crew should we need to. However, we don't want to enter a structure fire without a charge supplied line with us or near us because that puts us at severe risk. So if a search crew is going in, we also want an active uh, uh, water line going in with us. If it's absolutely necessary, we can do the, the search crew uh, in advance, but ideally we would not want to do that. The decon area, uh, I'd love to give a, a lot of credit to Andrew Goodlander. He invested a lot of man hours uh, and a lot of sweat uh, putting this together. Uh, we have a great collection of decon equipment on all of our apparatus. Uh, these orange buckets in the top of Rescue 5 are decon buckets. Inside of them, you will find a hose. This becomes our spray off hose with an adapter so that we can spray off firefighters whose turnout gear may have become contaminated. Uh, in the coffin compartment, you can see sort of up here, one of our brooms. These brooms are used for scrubbing down firefighters as they leave. And we also have laundry detergent available that will go into the buckets, fill the bucket with some water, uh, and then actively wipe down firefighters as they leave the scene. This picture on the right here, is a picture of um, this. This picture is a picture of uh, one of our engines. This is where all of our decon equipment is on the engine. You can see here's the orange bucket with the hose. Uh, here is our um, here's our detergent. Here again is another bin with hero wipes and red hoods, all available and accessible. Um, you know, for our uh, firefighters to get to. So what I wanna do is just take an opportunity right here to uh, see if there are any other comments, uh, questions, um, suggestions that we can uh, sort of quickly sort of go over and discuss. Uh, feel free to use the chat 
on the right hand side several people have been asking questions through there um, I apologize if I missed yours uh, Brad has indicated that interiors should only try to be uh, should try to only use two air tanks per fire unless absolutely necessary uh, adequate rehab is uh, required he's absolutely correct that this decreases uh, the cardiovascular stress on our firefighters uh, and as you know I harp on everyone uh, in terms of fitness to also help decrease the cardiac stress that you are facing. So uh, that's a good point, Brad. Thank you. As I said, we're going to start off with a little bit of a uh, practical application here by Lieutenant Jack Lysing. Um, so what I'm going to do, Jack, are you ready to roll? Uh, yeah. Can you see my screen right now? Okay. So uh Here's a quick overview of what we'll, we will be looking at during this portion of the drill. And uh, please stop me whenever you have questions. And if it looks like I'm reading off a piece of paper, I am. And uh, if I'm going too fast, that's why. Okay. So this is what we will be reviewing is, excuse me. We're gonna be looking at different hose lays in our fire trucks. And we're going to mainly be looking at what hose lays we have on our mutual aid companies for their first end trucks. And the last two points are pretty quick. We're just going to be looking at a quick pre-plan of the Country Cove Buffalo. And we're going to be looking at a short video of the new circular saws. Okay, so this will be a short review with some pictures of the most common hose loads that we see in the fire service. So it's important to understand these different hose loads. Just because we don't have these exact loads at main transit doesn't mean that we won't be pulling these loads on different fire trucks. We pull different loads from every uh, mutual aid truck in the area. So I'll be going through this part kind of fast. Uh, if anybody has any questions, like I said, you could just stop and uh, <clears throat> unmute yourself and just shout it out. Or if you have something, put it in the chat and Carl will shout it out and stop me. Um, so I'm sure there's a lot of ver other names or variations of these loads, but uh, I'm going directly about uh, off of what I found in the uh, New York State edition of the firefighters textbooks that we have in our uh, library room. So what we had on here is the accordion load, the flat load, the Minuteman load, and the triple layer load. Okay, so here's the accordion load. It's a basic hose load, and uh, it's basically just a hose load that's loaded on its side to look like an accordion. It's uh, not really seen that much in our area on the trucks um, that are around in our kind of mutual aid district, and it's uh, mainly used for supply lines. Okay, so here's the flat load, and uh, this is a load with simply laying the hose flat in the bed. This is a very common hose load, and uh, this or variation of this you will see on most fire trucks in our, our area, and it's used for both supply lines and attack lines. Okay, so here's the Minuteman load, and this is a variation of the flat load. It's pre-connected, and it's designed to be pulled and stretched out efficiently by one person. Essentially, the load in this picture is meant to be thrown on top of your shoulder, and flaked out with the remainder of the hose. The second man behind you can flake out the rest of it, but basically it's meant to be thrown on top of your shoulder. So I got a, a YouTube video here to show you. Don't mind the, uh, this is my mom's computer, so don't mind the recommendations here. If anybody wants to learn how to make French baguettes at home after we go watch that too. But here, so here's the Minuteman load. You see how it's stacked right here and the firefighter's gonna come up and he's gonna throw the load on top of his shoulder with the nozzle on it. And then what he does in this video is he grabs the uh, remainder loops right here. Uh, for most of the loads that we're going to be looking at, most of the departments that have the Minuteman loads, um, they don't really have anything set up to have the uh, loops right there. It's kind of just um, some of them are just two uh, loads next to each other that you'd both shoulder. But here's the Minuteman load. All right, so I'm just going to do a single man, single stack pull. Not much different here from the double stack. Still takes the time to be mindful of that first 100 feet. 
Make sure he pulls that straight out so that it keeps clear of the bottle. Takes a step out, now he addresses the supply side, grabs his mid bite as well as his dumb bite. His objective, feels tension, drops his dump bite, flakes out his mid bite, gets to the target, puts his back on the flow, I'll set it back to the floor, keep it straight, mix the muscle, last two bites, put it back. Okay, so that's the Miniman load. Next, we got the triple layer load, which is also a variation of the flat load. And it's basically achieved by uh, fold, folding the hose back onto itself. And this load in this picture is designed to be pulled uh, by one person, again, like the Minuteman load. And uh, here is a short video to show the triple layer load. Oscillator deployment performance standard. Uh, standard is going to start with a firefighter seat belted in the cab of the pumper with full gear on, mask in place. He's got 60 seconds to deploy the cross lay to uh, the front door of our imaginary burn building um, and pull a, a, a length or the first coupling with him as well. Um, once he's at the door with the nozzle in place where he goes, time will start uh, stop. Time stops when he's given the order to pull the cross leg. Jason, you ready? All right, pull the cross leg, go. And exit the pumper, take the seatbelt off and exit the pumper. He's gonna select his uh, cross leg to deploy. Find the nozzle, pull it out. He's going to ensure that the bite of hose is not in the bale of the nozzle and run it at an angle, not directly towards the front door of the house. Run at an angle until all the hose has cleared the cross lay hose bed. So come back. <clears throat> Set the nozzle at the front door and come back and get that first coupling. Bring that to the door with him. Once he grabs his nozzles in place, time will stop. Okay, so that's a triple layer load. Um, as far as I know, the de the uh, mutual aid departments that I looked at do not have um, triple layer load. Um, does anybody know any any departments in the area that carries the triple layer load? I tried looking, but I really couldn't find anybody. That's okay. Okay. Next, we got the hose loads that we have at Main Transit. Um, Carl kind of went into this a little bit already, but uh, before we look at mutual aid loads, we'll look at what uh, we have at Main Transit. So let's get into our, our hose loads. Pulling these lines is a skill that really should be, do, uh, be done hands-on practice, and it's kind of hard to show via picture and just explain in, in a short 30 seconds. Uh, and we will be implementing this into our uh, future hands-on drill. But for now, let's review with what we have with pitchers. So here's our speed loads that we have on all three of our engines. All three of our engines are the same, obviously. And both the top and bottom are the same. They're 200 feet of inch and uh, three-quarter with the combination nozzle attached. And they're both pre-connected. Okay. So next, here's a back picture of our engines, of our engine one, and just like the speed lays, they are set up the same, all our engine one, two, and three. So we're going to break this picture down from left to right. So first, we have 1,000 feet of 5-inch, and it's used for a supply line. And just so everybody knows, we have stickers um, describing what each one of these lines are. But uh, we got 1,000 feet of the 5-inch. Does anybody know why 1,000 feet is important? You would either put it in the chat or just shout it out if anybody's got the answer to that. Anybody got the answer to that? 
So basically, if a hydrant becomes compromised, we have enough, enough length to reach the next one. Okay, so attach the end of the hose of the loop that we just attached to the end of the hydrant for laying in and out of fires. Okay, so next up we have uh, the two pre-connected, uh, two and a half inch, one with the combination nozzle and one with the smooth bore uh, nozzle. The one on the left, the yellow line is 300 feet and the one on the right is 200 feet. And um, the difference between the combination nozzle and the smooth bore nozzle, everybody knows, is smooth bore nozzle produces a greater down per minute and has basically a greater reach. And uh, the combination tip you can put in a fog pattern and use the fog pattern for whatever different applications. So just a reminder to think about that whenever you're pulling one of these lines is what uh, best fits your application, the combination tip or this or the smooth bore nozzle. And but like the speed lathe, both of these have the loops in them and making them uh, easy to pull. Then all the way to the right, we have 500 feet of two and a half inch. Uh, we call this the dead lay. Does anybody know why we call it the dead lay? Nick Jackson says, because it's not pre-connected. There you go. Okay. Not pre-connected to an outlet, meaning that we have to pre-connect it. Okay. So right here in this, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but I got a pointer on here actually. Right here in this is our blitz fire. These are just on there to uh, protect the blitz fires from salt and, and whatnot, whatever else will get on them, road salt and stuff. So here's the blitz fires. And uh, the, everybody knows that blitz fires are used for exterior fight, firefighting. And uh, at Main Transit, it's our SOP to have at least one firefighter manning the blitz fire when in use. And I don't, I'm sure everybody's used these, but manning a two and a half with the blitz fire in one person is extremely easy. Okay, so next we have the front bumper, and in here we have a pre-connected five inch with a pre-connected uh, inch and three quarter uh, with a combination tip attached to it. So there's only two lengths in here, and it's extremely easy to pull with two firefighters. And basically the important part that we could add about this is just to get all of it out of the hose bed, obviously not to charge it in the hose bed. Mainly we use this for car fires. All right, so... Here's the real meat and potatoes of uh, my portion of the drill. And what we're going to be looking at is mutual aid department loads. So why is this important? So there's a good chance that we could be pulling lines off these department's trucks. So we really should know how to pull them or at least get a good look at them. All right. So we could be pulling these even if we are the fast team. If we get put, put to work as the fast team, of course, when another fast team arrives, we might have to pull lines off mutual aid trucks or just for life-saving interventions. So the departments we're going to be looking at that I got responses from are Harris Hill, Williamsville, East Amherst, Bowmansville, and then I got a couple friends in Getzville that wanted me to show their loads, and, and you'll see why. But all these we go mutual aid to. Okay, so before I go into detail about the loads, I'll briefly explain, uh, broken down via fire department, what our aid response to these departments are. So for Harris Hill fires, we will mostly send a pumper and a rescue. Okay, so I, I had extremely good feedback from Harris Hill, from Eddie Schmidt, uh, from Harris Hill. I basically just asked each department to sp send me two or three pitchers but Eddie sent me a bunch of pictures with an extremely good uh, description. So first for uh, Harris Hill, we have their truck six, which is a quint, meaning it's a ladder and it has a pump on it. It's first due to residential fires. And actually, strange tidbit, the Harris Hill SOP is to back into, with their quint, their ladder truck, they're back into the driveway of the fire. Kind of strange, but that's just what they do. Okay, so here is a side view of Paracel Truck 6, and these are all pre-connected flat loads. 
So working from left to right, breaking down this picture, uh, the orange line right here is 300 feet of pre-connected uh, two and a half inch with a blitz fire attached. You see blitz fire right here. Uh, the middle line, this yellow one with the red going through it, is 200 feet of two inch, not two and a half, two inch, with a combination nozzle. That's also pre-connected. Then the right blue line right here is 150 feet of inch and three quarter with a smoothbore nozzle. So unlike main transit, both their speed lays on their first two trucks are different sizes and both have different nozzles. So a uh, kind of interesting fact about this Eddie told me about is all of the orange hose that you'll see on any truck on uh, any Harris Hill truck is going to be two and a half inch and any yellow with the red going through it is going to be two inch. So I don't know if it's, if I would go off that, if it's, it's not, I mean, they might change the color of the hose or whatever, but just a kind of interesting fact. So orange is two and a half inch, yellow with the red going through it is the two inch. So here's a back view of Harris Hill truck six. On the left is 300 feet of two and a half inch, and that's not pre-connected. And then uh, that has a combination nozzle on it right there. And then on the right is a thousand feet of the five inch. That's also not pre-connected. And it looks like right here, they got some sort of rope or something just so you could grab the end of the nozzle or hook up to the hydrant with it. Okay, so here is Harris Hill engine two. So Harris Hill engine two is first due to commercial assignments. So this is what will be parked right out front of any commercial assignment. So here's a side view of engine two showing three loads. There's three loads in there. There's one, two, and then here's one on the bottom, which is the third. So the top load, the blue one right here, shown in this picture, this one tucked away right here, is 150 feet of pre-connected inch and three quarter with a combination nozzle on it. The middle load is 250 feet of inch and three quarter, or excuse me, 200 feet of pre-connected inch and three quarter with the smooth bore nozzle on it, this one right here. It, both of them also had the loops on it, the ears, or we call them the loops at Main Transit. And the bottom one right here is that yellow and red line. That's the two inch. That's 300 feet of pre-connected two inch. That's got a combination nozzle on it. So here's a rear view of Harris Hill engine two and uh, we're gonna break this picture working from left to right. So the left is 300 feet of pre-connected two and a half inch with a combination nozzle on it. You can just barely kind of see it, this picture. Then the middle is 1500 feet of uh, five inch used for a supply line. And then the right right here is 600 feet of not pre-connected uh, two and a half inch. They just use that as a supply line. Okay, so that's William, or that's uh, uh, Harris Hill, excuse me, and here's Williamsville. So for Williamsville, most of the time we're going to be sending a pumper or a ladder to the scene, except for on their west side of their district, we're going to be sending a fast team. But like I alluded to, that doesn't mean that we won't be pulling lines. So here is where they keep their uh, speed lays. This is their driver's side uh first compartment right here, this picture. So both Williamsville engine one and two are set up the same way. So for their speed lays, they have 200 feet of two and a half inch pre-connected. That's this yellow line right here. And they got a combination nozzle on it. And then on the right of it is 200 feet of inch and three quarter with the smooth bore nozzle. That's this blue line right here. And this picture on the right is showing um, this is showing the driver's side first compartment. This is, or excuse me, this is the driver's side. This is the passenger side compartment. So this is basically just the back side. This picture on the right is just the back side of that picture on the left that you're seeing. What you'll notice is they have these ropes attached right here and, and right here. Basically, all those ropes are there for is just so that you can grab the nozzle because you can see the nozzles are all the way pushed through on this side. So basically, it's just so that you can grab the nozzle. Here's a rear view of uh, Williamsville engine one and two. 
So the left pitcher is uh, two and a half used for extra supply line. The right pitcher is a thousand feet of five inch. And then it's on the right is 600 feet of a uh, two and a half inch with a smooth bore nozzle on it. And it looks like they got um, two loops right here that you could just grab onto. I think I remember uh, Jim Christopher is the one that got me these pictures. I think I remember him saying it's about nine feet to get up there. So instead of jumping up there, you can just grab these loops and it'll bring you, that one will bring you the nozzle. And this one will bring you the, the end of the whole end of the five inch right here for hooking up the hydrants. So next we have uh, East Amherst. So for East Amherst, we go fast on the initial response and we'll send a pumper uh, for the second or third alarm, depending on the alarm or depending on the area. So most of the time we, we will be going fast, but that doesn't mean we won't be pulling line from an East Amherst truck. So here is East Amherst Engine 3. This is out of their Station 2. I know all of us have had an extremely good look at this truck the past couple months, but uh, here's a side view of it right here, and they have uh, two pre-connected inch and three quarters, uh, one with a combination nozzle, or excuse me, both with a combination nozzle attached to it. And on the right here, they have a pre-connected two and a half inch with a smooth bore nozzle attached. You can see the smooth bore right there. And then the picture on the left here is the back of uh, engine three, East Amherst engine three. And then uh, starting on the left right, right here, they have a uh, pre-connected two and a half inch on this dark blue line right here. And they have the blitz fire attached to it. And it looks like the end of the tip of it is actually um, the smooth bore tip of the blitz fire, which is actually kind of cool. So then in the middle, they have their five inch. I didn't get the exact length of it, but that looks like 1500 square feet. I don't know if anybody knows this exact length. If you do put it in the chat or, or just shout it out, but I'm sure that looks a lot more than a thousand. I would say that's about 1500 square feet or 1500 feet lengthwise on that. And then the right here, I didn't get the length on that one either, but that is just two and a half, uh, not pre-connected. They just, or excuse me, pre-connected, used for a supply line. Okay, so here is Bowmansville. And Bowmansville is kind of extremely important in this sense. And uh, because they're, they're a department we go mutual aid to, I mean, we don't really know a lot about. We don't really see their trucks a lot. They're not in the town of Amherst, so we don't see them as much as we do other departments, say at like a PR event or something like that. We really don't train with them as much as uh, we do other departments in, say, Williamsville and East Amherst and Harris Hill. So what I'm getting at here is we don't see much of their hose loads or really their equipment on any of their trucks for that matter. So it's kind of important just to at least see some pictures and at least see what we're looking at. So without ma making the mutual aid response too confusing, we basically go mutual aid for a portion of their district based on the alarm, uh, what kind of fire and the area. So depending on the kind of fire, we are either sending a pumper or a ladder. So there's a good chance for whatever reason we could be working off Bowman, Bowmansville's lines, excuse me. All right, so here is Bowmansville truck one. Bowmansville truck one is a quint like Harris Hill and it's first out of their station one for structure fires in the picture on the right are Minuteman loads. The Minuteman loads are the ones that they shouldered. The one that I showed the first YouTube video I showed and they're both uh, 200 feet of the Minuteman loads. They're inch and three quarter and they both have combination nozzles on it. And the load on the left is 200 feet of two and a half inch. And that also has a combination nozzle on it. So all three of these are going to be Minuteman loads that you, that you would shoulder, and all, all of them have a combination nozzle on it. And here is the front bumper of their truck one, and it's uh, 200 feet of pre-connected inch and three-quarter, and they double donut rolled this length right here. It's an additional 50 feet right in the middle. So it's kind of a 
funky get up they got going on here but so this is the front of their truck one which would be first out of their station one for structure fires Okay, so Getzville. Here's a couple of pictures from Getzville Engine 2. And this is not as important to us as other departments because we rarely kind of go mutual aid to them. We go to those other departments a lot more than Getzville. But I found it kind of interesting because they have all minute man loads and they have all smooth bore nozzles. So on the left here, they have two uh, pre connected inch and three quarter minute man nozzles. It's the orange line and the green line right here, and they both have smooth bore nozzles on it. See the smooth bore, and then this is the other side of it. Here's that smooth bore on that side. So basically, to deploy these lines, here's the driver's side, I believe, which is the green line right here, and then here's the passenger side. You would basically just grab this length right here with the nozzle on it, if you're the nozzle man, the first one, put it on your shoulder and deploy that, and then the backup firefighter, would uh, flake out the rest of it from the hose bed. Okay, so then the other two loads that they got here are 350 feet of inch and three quarter and uh, 350 feet of two and a half inch. So two and a half inch, here's it, uh, 350 feet of inch and three quarter. And both of them have smooth bore nozzles on them. So when I talked to the guys from Getzville, they were very, very, very proud of the fact that they only use smoothbore nozzles on all their trucks. That's all they kept mentioning is they only use smoothbore nozzles on all their trucks. And for whatever reason, I guess this is a huge thing at Getzville. But uh, they did mention they did have combination nozzles in their trucks. Um, but for what, from what I understand, they only use smoothbore nozzles on, um, on all their trucks. Hang on, Carly just sent me a text. Seeing it. Okay, Carly just texted me an extremely good point. He just said, just so you know, Williamsville uses four inch supply, not five inch, and that's an extremely good catch right there. Eggertsville, Snyder, North Bailey, North Amherst, and Williamsville all use four inch. Okay, so that's Williams Williamsville, Eggertsville, Snyder. North Bailey, North Amherst, and Williamsville all use 4-inch. Everyone east in Amherst Fire Control use 5-inch hose supply. Okay, thanks, Carly. That's an extremely good catch. Okay, so to wrap up this section, there are a lot of things to think about when going, mutual aid, when going to mutual aid fires. What kind of hose lays they have, have on their trucks is just an extremely small part of the things we should be thinking about. There's a lot of equipment on fire trucks and it's hard to keep up with what is even on our trucks and how to use that equipment. So when it comes to mutual aid trucks, it's important we take a quick look at what they have. A good opportunity to do this is say at uh, an open house or maybe after a fire, whenever we're kind of in front of the truck and we could ask somebody from that department uh, just some questions. I'm, I'm certain that anybody from any of our mutual aid districts wouldn't mind answering a few questions. So another very big part of mutual aid is looking at different buildings in their districts, just as we would do when we're looking through, um, when we're driving through our districts, we can do a mental pre-plan driving through their districts. And that's, um, that's what we should do, be looking at commercial structures is a big one, driving through mutual aid districts. If that commercial structure starts on fire, you can bet that we'll be there. Okay, so here's a pre-plan of the Country Cove Buffalo. And as you can see, I numbered the holes. So here's Young's Road, obviously. Here's Sheridan Drive, the main streets up here. Everybody knows the overview of Country Cove Buffalo. So just so everybody knows, hole number one and 18 are the only ones across the street on the same side as the... Um, as the clubhouse right here. And here's, here's the driving range for whatever reason where we'd have to know that. So I don't know if, if anybody knew or was at the call a couple of years ago when we got a cardiac arrest on hole number six. Hole number six is over here. But we were all extremely confused on how to even get on the course or let alone where hole number six was. So I put red X's. There's three of them. There's one right here, 
one right here, and there's one right here. That that one's right across my, the street from my house, right on Sheridan Drive. But basically, what these red X's are is uh, an entry point to get onto the golf course. So this, the one right here is where we entered to get to hole number six. And then this one, it, the maintenance building's right here, but you can get onto the course from the maintenance building. Then this one, it uh, you can see it, it's chained off, but it looks like you kind of got to be looking for it. But once you see it, you'll see it's an entryway and it's just a chained off area right there. The maintenance uses it. But basically, once you get through that chain right there, it brings you right up into the uh, cart path and we could drive any of our smaller trucks for whatever reason we have to get onto this golf course. These three X's are how we would do it. One, two, three right here. And I'm going to be putting this pre-plan in uh, where the pre-plans are stored and in uh, every truck. So, okay. So in the upper left-hand corner right here is the shooting range. And I don't know if anybody's been down to the shooting range down here, but basically to get down there, you'd have to come in through the driveway and come in through this parking lot right here. Like I said, here's the clubhouse, but here's the big long driveway. Basically, this entrance right down here is super, super tight and extremely steep and not very well maintained. So basically meaning we'd have an extremely tough time getting our big trucks down there. So that would be our engines, our rescue five, and our ladder. So down by the shooting range, I don't know if anybody's seen the little hut they got there, but it's basically just a uh, shed, and it does have an alarm system in it. So in the event of a fire call at the shooting range, this is just the shooting range talking. There's only that one little building, so it shouldn't happen too often. Uh, the big trucks are to stage in this area, this big, huge parking lot. We should have no problem fitting all our trucks in there. They're to stage in this parking lot and wait for orders from the officer in charge. So if there actually is a fire down here, we most likely would have to come over to, I think this is AAA right here, <clears throat> excuse me, and just stretch a line right, right across to get water on the fire. Okay, so... Jack? Yeah, go uh, on. We have a question from Ryan asking if there is uh, ammunition stored in that uh, lodge. Okay, so that was my next thought right here. One more thing to think about is the maintenance building right here. I believe I couldn't get an exact um, address, but I believe it's 309 Young's. That is where the ammunition is stored in the maintenance building. There's a big sign on it that says ammunition stored within or something like that. It, but it's a big sign. It's basically for us. And uh, the reason for that, it's got to be stored in a climate controlled room. And they do have a locked area. It's in the back left corner of this big maintenance building. Um, I'm sure those guys would let us in there if we ever want to go check it out. But um, it's just a big room and it's stored with all shotgun shells. And then basically on the back end of this building, we have pesticide storage too, which is another thing to think about. So in the maintenance shop, here's oils and equipment. And with that, there's going to be ammunition and pesticides. So that's something to think about when responding to the maintenance area here. Uh, Jack, uh, yeah. there's an, uh, another comment from uh, Andrew Mazurik uh, identifying another gate by the tunnel uh, to access the shooting range near Sheridan Drive. Yes. Okay. So that's an extremely good point. That to get through there, it's extremely marshy through here. That's why I didn't put that one. I believe it's right around it's right around here. Uh, what he's talking about, the tunnel. There's if if uh, everybody didn't know, there's two tunnels that go below Young's Road for them to drive their uh, golf carts or for walkers to go on. One of them's right here, and one of them's right above here. So that's that's where they get across the course. And everybody sees everybody walking across here in the walkway. But anyways, there's an entrance way to get through right here. But to get to the shooting range from that entrance way, it's extremely marshy through here. It's almost kind of a swamp a little bit in this area. So, yes, uh, Maz, you're right. You can get through to the course right there. You can also get up 18. Um, that would be right there. I can fix that. I'll put a red X right there. But just be mindful when getting through there. I don't think I would drive drive through that. But just so you know, there is another entranceway right there. Okay. 
Okay, so moving along. Here's the new uh, circular saws that we purchased. They're the TS700, the still saws. And um, we got five identical saws, uh, one for each one of the engines, one, two, and three, one for five, and one for six. So we did end up going with the bigger blades, uh, the 14-inch blades, as compared to the 12-inch, which uh, we have the 12-inch on the engines and the... Um, on the ladder truck, and we got the 14 inch blade on the uh rescue truck. And after talking to Havis and discussing it a little bit with the uh, uh, officers, we just decided to go with the a little bit bigger blade, the 14 inch blade. And um, it's the same starting technique as the one we have in five, it looks extremely similar to the one we have in five. It basically is the same thing, but obviously newer, a little bit newer model. And so I'm going to break down uh, the starting procedure on this with some pictures, and I got a short video. Okay, so this, just like the rest of our uh, saws, takes the 50, 50 to 1 premix, which we have in every truck, uh, every truck where there is a saw. Okay, so basically I broke this down with pictures, and I numbered the pictures. So first you're going to press the decompression switch on the top. That's going to make, make it extremely easy for you to pull it. And next, you're going to pump the primer valve. And in the manual, they recommend you press the primer valve seven to ten times. I don't think I've ever pressed it seven to ten times. I've only done it about three times. But <clears throat> if they're saying it in the manual, it must be true. So pump it seven to ten times. Okay, so next, you'll switch the choke to halfway, which is right here. All you got to do is flip that little lever. Flip it down to halfway, and you'll squeeze both of these handles, step four here, that handle and that handle. You'll squeeze both of the handles, and you'll flip this switch all the way down to where it says start, right here. So that's the third click. You'll hear three clicks, one, two, three, and you flip it down to start, okay? And then next, you'll put your foot right in here just to make sure the, the saw doesn't really move anywhere, and you'll pull the cord and start the saw. If the saw doesn't start up after maybe a couple poles, let's say f five to six poles, uh, you can refer back to the choke right here and switch it to the full choke all the way down to the third uh, bottom right here. Uh, Jack? Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> uh, we, have a, we have a question here. Uh, can you explain a little more why we only use half choke and what will happen if we were to use the full choke? Okay, so that's a good one. So if you do go directly into the full choke, there's a chance that you're going to flood the engine, which which is extremely possible. It's, these saws are complicated because we don't use them every day. They're meant to be run on... Uh, every other day or at least once a week. And a lot of our officers really do try to start them um, uh, um, at bare minimum once a month. But if you do start at full choke right away and keep pulling on it, there's a chance you're going to flood it. You're going to flood it and you're going to have an extremely tough time starting it and, and uh, uh you're going to let have to let, let it sit uh before you, you can start it again but basically that makes that saw useless for that time being excuse me here's a video i was having a tough time getting this video but as you can see right here here's the composite just used it for this video uh now but Here's just a short video. Let me play it. I'm getting the air code. Okay. It's not going to let me play it. It's just a short video of me starting the saw, but um, I just broke it down for pictures there. Okay. Uh, Jack, <clears throat> what we can do for that is uh, you, you can send me the uh, video, and I will embed it in the presentation as well as send a link out so that people can watch it. We'll put it on YouTube for everybody so that you can have access to it. Thank you guys for the time, and uh, Carl, uh, it's back to you. All right. Thanks, Jack.
Uh, appreciate that update. That was a, a really good overview of uh, everything that we're seeing here. Um, from, uh, as I said, you know, mutual aid, uh, what we're doing initial 10 at uh, our scenes, as well as what we may be facing when we're at a Harris Hill or a Bowmansville event. Uh, you never really know where you're going to end up or what job you're going to end up doing uh, when you're on scene. Uh, as I said, we'll get you that video of the saw, saws starting so that everyone gets a chance to review it. I encourage you to go through uh, with either a truck officer uh, or someone who has started the saws before when you're up at the station uh, just to get your hands on it, uh, move through the buttons, start it up so that we're all accustomed to potentially opening those up on a scene uh, should we need to. Um, so we've just got a quick, uh, we're going to conclude here in a couple of minutes. All right. So uh, you can load up the presentation screen uh, on the right-hand side now. Uh, just to do a little bit of a uh, debriefing, um, what I like to do is I like to think of uh, everything that we do in terms of what's known as a SWOT analysis, and that includes the strengths, the weaknesses, uh, the opportunities, uh, and the threats that we may face uh, while doing any of this. So I just want to open up um, the chat bar here on the side. Uh, and what I'd like to do is open it up to see if anybody has any tips or tidbits of information that they can share uh, on the information that we've provided. Uh, it can be framed in terms of what we know we do well and why we do it that way, or is there an opportunity to change? Maybe you've seen something that, that we should be uh, considering uh, in terms of those initial 10 minutes uh, to a scene. So I'm going to leave that chat open here uh, on the screen for you. The other thing I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to copy and paste a link into the chat forum on the side here. Uh, and with that link, hopefully that comes through, uh, that link is actually going to take you to the evaluation form for the drill. Uh, it's not mandatory that you fill that out. Uh, I hope that you will take the opportunity to click on that link access the evaluation so that Jack and I can get some feedback as to uh, how you felt the drill went tonight, um, valuable information, uh, tidbits that you learned. Uh, this way, if we have to continue offering uh, drills in this virtual format, uh, maybe we can look to improve it uh, or we can look to offer different opportunities uh, to our members. So please, again, uh, that's in the chat bar. There's a form. I will also send that out on email. Uh, from here, uh, what I want to say is, you know, thanks uh, for joining us tonight. Uh, be safe. Stay healthy. Stay well. Uh, use this opportunity uh, where not much is going on to really sort of reconnect with yourself, reconnect with your family. Uh, it's a great opportunity that many of us who have overscheduled uh, lives, uh, we can now recenter and refocus a little bit more. So take advantage of that. Um, I'm going to be available for any questions. Feel free to reach out. Again, I'll shoot an email out with that evaluation link if you are unable to access it uh, at this point. From, uh, from Jack and myself, I'd like to thank you for attending. Uh, from all the officers, thank you for allowing this platform uh, to take place. Uh, you'll all get credit and um, we will talk to you soon. All right. Feel free to log off and uh, see you at the next one.